Hi folks, Mr. Eck here. Today we're going to, have to finish part three of our video on polar graphs. This is going to be polar graphs drawn by hand. Uh, so, I don't know why I said video two here, but this is video number three uh, of a series on videos. I do hope you've watched the last two videos in the series because that's where we talked about why the polar graphs kind of do what they do and what the general families of these graphs are. I am, I personally, really want to lean on that knowledge and where these come from. So I would recommend watching those before you uh, just watch this video. But uh, if you're here and you've watched those other ones, well, you're in the right place because what we did in the last couple sets of videos is we used our technology tools to graph polar graphs using Desmos and using GeoGebra and all this cool stuff. But when it comes down to you doing your homework in your notebook, you don't have Desmos in your notebook. So you are going to have to do some polar graphs on your very own. The first thing you're going to need for this is some polar graph paper. This is the kind I have found. Um, you, I know I've probably posted some to our Google Classroom. You can also just search online for polar graph paper. Uh, but what I would recommend is finding some polar graph paper that uh, goes to at least pi over 12s, not because you need the pi over 12s. In fact, you, you don't need the pi over 12s. But what you do need is to have a common denominator so that you get the pi over 3s, pi over 6s, and pi over 4s. So you have all of those common radians going around. Um, and then as much radius, you know, go, it needs to go out as far as the equations will let you. So all of our equations today go no greater than 4. So that will be enough for us today. So the first thing we're going to graph here is r equals 4 cosine theta. And there are a couple techniques that I would use. Um, so the, the blind way to approach this is to say, all right, I have, I don't know what this is, 24 angles all around the circle. Let me make a t-chart with 24 different radii and plot every single one of those points and see what I get. Well, nobody really wants to do that, me included. So I want to do a little thinking ahead of time. If I'm doing four cosine theta, it really was going to help you to think about what is x equals, nope, y equals four cosine x look like. So y equals four cosine x starts at zero, ends at two pi, has a minimum value at pi, and these happen at, changes happen at pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2. So you know, this is what cosine is going, and it's important to notice too that cosine starts at its highest value, travels through 0, then its lowest value, then back through 0 and back to its highest value. So those are going to be probably the most important values. Um, so I don't know, let's start filling out our table. The first value here is zero. I don't know why that's smaller. Uh, the first theta value here is zero. Remember here that theta are the inputs and r are the outputs. So we're looking, even though it's going to be a circle, we're looking at something that ends up like a function of r in terms of theta. So what's the cosine of zero? Uh, this is some really good unit circle practice. The cosine of zero is one, because it's the x value, times four, the radius at theta zero should be four. So if I was going to plot, I'm not going to graph this piece by piece, but if I was going to graph this right here, then I would plot a point at angle zero, right? No angle and radius four. Okay. Now I could go ahead and go to the pi over six, but I know if I do enough sines and cosines, I'm going to get into like the land of square roots and trig and stuff that's just not very fun. So I might as well, or I, what I'd like to do is go through this table and look for values that are going to be nice. Uh, and the values that are going to be nice are values like 4, negative 4, and 0. So uh, I noticed that cosine was 4 at 0. I also know that at 2 pi, cosine 4 cosine x will be back to 4. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. I don't know. That wasn't in there before, but... Uh, let's see, what about at the pi over 2s? At pi over 2, cosine is 0. So at pi over 2, 4 cosine theta is already going to be 0. And at 3 pi over 2, the same thing is going to happen. So I've got some values in. I also, also know that at pi, the angle pi, cosine is also uh, at a maximum. It's at negative 4. So at pi, I'm going to get the value negative 4. Now, I'm going to go ahead and plot these in here, and let's see if that tells us anything. 
pi over 2, we're supposed to have 0. At pi, we have angle negative 4, so I hit that thing again. And at 3 pi over 2, I get 0. Uh, so I guess it's not really told me anything. I'm hitting the same points over and over again, but it seems like, because I'm hitting the same points over and over again, that maybe I'm going to have some kind of graph that, that just hits these points twice. Um, if you were paying attention in the last video, you already know what kind of graph this is going to be. I'm just kind of pretending that I don't know what this is right now. Uh, but I, I hope that you already know what you're expecting. All right, so how are we going to do this? Let's do pi over 6. What's cosine of pi over 6? That's root 3 over 2, so this ends up being 4 root 3 over 2, which is the same as 2 root 3. Uh, root 3 is about 1.7, so this is going to be about 3.4. If I didn't know that, I would, uh, you know, in my head, I would just go to my calculator. Now, here I'm going to do some symmetry again. At the pi over 6s, not every pi over 6, but the pi over 6s that are one tick away from the axis, the cosine value is always going to be root 3 over 2, positive or negative. So I'm going to go through all of these angles and find all the places where this might have some symmetry. I know pi over 6 is going to have symmetry with 7 pi over 6, as well as 5 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. Uh, pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6, it'll both be positive, so I'm going to do positive 3.4, 5 and 7. That's going to be negative 3.4 because those angles are in quadrants where x is negative. At the pi over 4s, uh, cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And this is 4 root 2 over 2, so that's the same as 2 root 2. Uh, root 2 is about 1.4. Again, if you don't know that, just go to your calculator. Uh, 1.4 times 2 is about 2.8. So everywhere that has some symmetry with the pi over 4s is going to have a radius of 2.8. And I know that there's four places that have symmetry with the pi over 4s. Uh, pi over 4 is going to be positive. 7 pi over 4 is also going to be positive. 5 and 3 pi over 4 are both going to be negative. And again, why are those negative? Well, because I'm doing a cosine graph. So this is cosine that's negative in those other two quadrants. Okay, so I'm starting to get some more points. Looks like, actually, because I've been so smart about using symmetry, and as you should also be smart about using symmetry, I really only have to worry about the pi over 3. So what's cosine of pi over 3? That's actually 1 half. So I'm doing 4 times 1 half. You don't need your calculator to do that one. That's 2. Uh, and now what has symmetry with the pi over 3s? Well, pi over 3 is symmetric with 5 pi over 3. We get a value of 2. 4 pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3 are in the uh, second and third quadrants. So those are going to also give you values of 2, but it will be negative. Okay, so we've now completed basically the entire table using symmetry to be smart. Now, will, will symmetry always work here? No. And by the way, when I say symmetry, I'm not talking about those three symmetry tests you might have read about in your textbook, the polar symmetry and axis symmetry. I'm just saying the symmetry of the unit circle, the symmetry of cosine, because where does this come from? It's coming from cosine. Okay, I'm going to stop talking and just plot out these values at every angle. I'm going to kind of use the radii and carefully plot and just go in order. So at pi over 6, I'm going to plot about 3.4. That's going to be about 2.8. That's going to be about 2. At pi over 2, I have 0. Ah, now this is where it gets interesting. At 2 pi over 3, I had the radius value of negative 2. So I have to look at, imagine I'm looking at 2 pi over 3, then I have to find that line, clean up here, uh, and go backwards to negative 2. Right, so that point is actually 2 pi over 3 comma negative 2 if I wanted to write in the coordinates of that value. Okay. Now I'm going to keep going and I, I notice I have negative radii for the next three values so they're going to travel around in the fourth quadrant actually. Uh, I have a 2.8 opposite 3 pi over 4 and a 3.4 opposite the 5 pi over 6. And then I have this uh, pi comma negative 4 that lands me back here. And it actually turns out that I'm done. Why am I done? Well, 
this graph has gone exactly back to where it started. So what are we what graph are we looking at? Well, we're looking at a circle. There it is. Okay, maybe not quite perfect as a circle. Why is that not quite perfect? I see it because 3.8 is a little further. Uh, no, 3.4. 3.4 is a little further out here. Maybe my 2.8 is a little off. I'm not sure. That's a better. We're looking at a circle. And if you were going to travel down and plot these values, why don't I go ahead and do that? I would plot these. I'm going to plot these values in red. I would go 13 pi, not pi over 12, 7 pi over 6. I would plot negative 3.4. Oh, I'd hit that point. Negative 2.8, right here. Negative 2, right here. 0, right here. And then I'd be back into the fourth quadrant. I'd be plotting positive 2, 2.8, 3.4, and 4. And I would be done. And it kind of looks like a huge mess, and it is, because that's a lot of values to put on a graph. It's really important to be really careful. I want you to imagine, right? Imagine you're doing this and you don't know that you're expecting a circle because you didn't pay attention in the last two videos. And maybe you made one mistake with your negative radius and had one single point out here. I see this every year. You know, they get the whole circle and then here's what students will do. They'll do the whole circle and then their circle will have like a little arm off of it or something. I've never seen a polar graph that looks like that with an equation like four cosine theta. So if you're finding your polar graphs have weird little appendages, what that means is that you probably should check your values in your table. And I want to take a moment here and show you how to look at this on your calculator. I'm going to put myself over in that corner. We'll look at our calculator over in this corner. Um, because doing this on your calculator is so unbelievably helpful. Uh, now, your calculator is not particularly prepared for polar mode until, until you turn it into polar mode. So what are you going to do first is press the mode button. And there's two things you need to check here. One is that you're in radians. This one is because I just turned it on. And then you're going to go to the line right underneath it where it says func par pol sec, S-E-Q. Function stands for function. Par stands for parametric, which we'll use very soon. Pol stands for polar. Sequence stands for sequence. I'm not sure what that actually does. Go ahead and select P-O-L. Go ahead and hit enter. If you're sure you're in radians, hit second mode, you'll quit that out, and now you're ready to graph in polar. Let's go to your y equals, and look at what you get. Now your graph is of the form r equals blah blah blah. That's what we want. So we can type in r equals 4 cosine. Oh my gosh, where's the theta button? I don't know how to get theta. Do I have to go into a secret menu? No! See this button that says xt theta n? That button gives you the correct variable for the mode you're in. It's a mode detecting button. So I press that button, I get four cosine theta, hit enter, done, good to go. You can hit graph and you can see, oh, uh, uh, that's kind of an ugly looking thing. So here's the thing about your calculator. It's not very good at graphing polar equations. Polar equations are often circles, but your calculator just doesn't quite have the pixels to deal with. And this default window is, is uh, not actually square, right? It's rectangular, and so the scale's off. So this is why this looks like a squished, ugly egg. You can, of course, zoom. Uh, I like to sometimes zoom square so it looks nice. Helps a little bit, and you can, you know, zoom in. Helps a little bit. Honestly, this still kind of looks like a, I don't know, a weird octagon. So it's kind of really better for you to graph by hand anyway. But here's what I really like the calculator for. It's not the actual graph, because that can get me just messy really fast. It's the ta table feature. So if you have your equation in your y equals, r equals 4 cosine theta, and you go to the table, you can see all kinds of different values, right? You can see for theta, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you can see all the different radius values. And Notice how it says press plus for delta table. Delta table is the change in table value. So looking at our graph, our change in table, our delta table was pi over 12. Right now this delta, this table is default. It's set to integers. So if I press plus right here, like it says, I can set the delta table to be, what if I set it to be 
pi, where is pi? Pi's over here, over, uh, let's just do the pi over sixes. Now it's not gonna tell you the actual values, um, the pi values, because it's, it's a calculator, it's estimating, which you can see that there's, here's pi, right, 3.14, and then here's all the different uh, decimals of pi over six, and look at the values that you get. You get zero, four, oh, hey, we had that. Uh, pi over six, 3.4, oh, we had that. Uh, 1.04, we have two. Oh, see, it skips the pi over fours if you do it this way. So you go 3.4, you go two, zero, then negative two, um, negative 3.4, and negative four. And this is capturing, if my face would get out of the way, this is capturing all of the values we just put on our table. Ooh, there. Oh, boy. And if you want to do, you can you plus for delta table again. Uh, if you really want to get fancy, you can set your delta table to pi over 12 to exactly match all the, the, the dots on your graph. Then you just go down here and plot the values every time you see it on the graph, right? Uh, I think the hardest part here is just making sure you don't lose count of all the pi over 12. But you can always use the values of pi you know, like 3.14, to tell you where you're at. I personally think this is the best way to use this uh, table or use your calculator to graph polar, right? You're still making the graph by hand, but you are helping yourself fill out the table by using your calculator. And so that's a tool available to you when a polar equation gets really complicated. This is what I would highly recommend. Okay, so let's sketch a graph of r equals two cosine of three theta. Now, if you've watched the second video in this series, you would rec recognize that this is expecting a, or we should be expecting here, a rose curve. And furthermore, you might recognize that we are expecting three petals on the rose curve, because when that number is odd, that directly tells you the number of petals. If you really were paying attention in the video, you might recognize that those three petals are going to be drawn from zero to pi, and then it's going to repeat. Like it's actually drawing six petals, uh, but drawing the, the next set of petals on top of themselves. They're, they're repeating, kind of like with the circle, repeated itself as it went around. So using that, um, I also noticed there's a two out here that's going to kind of change the size. Using that, I can actually already kind of anticipate what this graph will look like, but just to be sure... We're going to graph it anyway. I'm also going to sketch over here a graph of 2 cosine 3 theta. So that would go up to 2, down to minus 2. The period would be 2 pi over b, which is 2 pi over 3. So uh, I would have to do something like put 2 pi here, then maybe cut it into 3. And then each of these would be another trip of cosines. So the graph's going to think about this graph. It's really going to look something like this. One, two, three loops. And we can think about where, then when the, when, where the minima and maxima will be. So this is 2 pi over 3. This has to be then 4 pi over 3. This has to be 2 pi over 3. 6 then, and this has to be, um, which is just pi over 3. So you can think about where kind of the zeros and the minima and the maxima are um, and, and help you expect some things. Let's do the zeros at least. Uh, I think I am going to use the calculator to help me with the decimals here, but let's do the zeros at least. So uh, cosine of 0 is 1. Um, 3 times 0 is just 0 times 2 is 2. So I'm going to start at a radius of 2. Okay, so then let's like at least plug in a couple of values by hand. So this is 2 cosine of 3 times pi over 6 is 3 pi over 6. That's pi over 2. What's cosine of pi over 2? It's 0. So this is actually just 0. Pi over 4? Uh, well, that's going to be the same as 2 cosine of 3 pi over 4, right? So if you're plugging in the angles, they're getting multiplied and kind of mapped around to weird different quadrants. The cosine of 3 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2, so this is going to be negative root 2, because it's times 2, uh, or negative 1.4. Very interesting. I think I'll just do the first quadrant as an example of how you plug stuff in. 
uh, cosine of pi over 3. So 2 cosine pi over 3 times 3 is just pi. So this is going to be 2 cosine pi. Pi is negative. Cosine pi is negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Cosine of pi over 2, this is going to be the same as 2 cosine 3 pi over 2. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is the x-coordinate, so it's going to be 0. 2 times 0 is still 0. So if I'm going around, I'm plotting these values, I get pi over 6, I get then I go to 0. At pi over 6, right, the radius is 0. So I might actually really want to plot the pi over 12 also. I'm going to use the calculator for that. Uh, then at pi over 4, right, at pi over 4, I'm at negative 1.4. So that's like out here. Then at pi over 3, I'm at negative 2. I'm out here. Right, so at pi over 3, again, you have to go negative opposite the direction of the angle you look at and count 2. And then at pi over 2, I'm back to 0 again. This just doesn't feel like a lot of good evidence. Uh, but if you know what you're expecting, which is a rose curve of three petals, you can actually start to sketch the graph right now. I know I'm expecting a rose curve. Rose curves look like this. Then it would curve around into the other quadrant. That's going to be the, the next maximum. The pi over 12 is when it would be kind of the mirror here. And then at pi over 2, it would be back to 0. Then there would be one more curve over in this quadrant somewhere. And it would curve back around and hit zero. And you can tell already, as soon as I ran out of points to plot, I kind of lost the thread of the graph. But this is also becoming kind of a huge pain in the tuchus because of multiplying the angle and doing all the trig. And you don't even like, because you're not doing the pi over 12s, you don't even get all the values you want. So I'm going to go back to my friend, the calculator, type this in and get the values from the calculator. I thought I'd just show you the guys the calculator steps again, so I went to mode, I checked that I'm in polar mode, and I'm in radians. So I go to y equals. Uh, I already have the 2 cosine uh, 3 theta, right? The x button gives you the theta. Close your parens. Hit enter. We can go to the graph and see if we get anything useful. We probably won't. It's too small and, and squiggly. I don't like that graph at all. So let's go to the table. Second graph gives you, brings you to the table. The theta values right now are not very useful, but if you press plus for delta table, we can set it to anything that we want. I want, I think, from what I've already researched, I want the pi over 12s. I need that data. So each of these is going to be one step around on the graph. Okay, now this is going to help me out a lot. Mm. Try to make it so I can draw and read at the same time. So I'm going to be at 1.4, so I was a little off here. I'm going to get rid of this curve. The values from the calculator I'm going to do in uh, orange, we'll say. I'm going to do 1.4, 0, negative 1.4, I had that one. Negative 2, I had that one. Negative 1.4, I had that one. Okay, 0, I'm back to here. Now I have to scroll down. So 1.5708 was the last value I did. At 1.8, that's the 7 pi over 12, I'm going to be back at 1.4. Then I'm going to be back at 2, at 2 pi over 3, then back to 1.4, then back to 0 again. Then at 2.7, that looks like it's 1 before pi, so it's going to be up here. I have to be at negative 1.4. Mm, okay. Then at pi, I'm back at negative 2, and it looks like I've completed the graph, because if I keep scrolling, I, you know, 3.04, I get negative 1.4, so negative 1.4, oh, that would be that point I've already plotted. And at uh, 3.66, I get 6 times 10 to the negative 13, that's basically 0, so at 7 pi over 6, I should be at basically 0. I'm getting the points I've already done. So this is enough data for the graph. I already said I probably don't need the second half of the graph. I just need this missing quadrant. But it really does help to have the pi over 12, so your calculator is really nice if you know how to work it. And that's why it's really important to, you know, figure out how to work these tools you have. So let's sketch this rose curve. With the points plotted, you can make a really nice graph. There we go. Look at that, Desmos. Don't even need you. 
We've got our, our hands and our eyes and our graphing calculators. We don't need any, any fancy technology to make these graphs. Uh, let's do a couple more here. I know this video is getting a bit, little bit long, but at this point, you know, if, if you're here, you're probably here because you need some examples. So we're just going to do them and I can, I can show you my process. Um, we're looking at r equals 3 sine of theta plus 1. I remember from the last video that this is one of those things that maybe was those limosones that had that inner loop. Some of them didn't have an inner loop. Some of them were just heart shaped. Um, so I think about this by, again, graphing, you know, y equals 3x. 3 sine x plus 1. What will that look like? We'll have a midline of 1, and it'll have an amplitude of 3, so it's going to go up to 4 and down to minus 2, and it's going to be sine. So it's going to start at its 0. No period change, so that's going to go to 2 pi. So I could actually, this is, this is maybe not too bad to plot the points for. Um, all right, let's plot a couple of points. 3 sine of 0, sine of 0 is 1. So this is really 3 plus 1, or 4. Oh, okay, that wasn't that bad. That's, is that true? No. Sine of 0 is 0, so 3 times 0 plus 1 is 1. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so this is really 3 plus 1, or 4. 3 pi over 2 is going to be negative 3 plus 1, or negative 2. Uh, where is sine 0? How about pi? So, uh, when sine is 0, 3 plus 0 is also 1. And at 2 pi, I should also be 1. So I already got some values on here. These other values are just going to get really annoying. So I'm going to ask the calculator. Let's take a look. Again, just to look over the steps, make sure your mode is in POL, stands for polar, and you're in radians. Go to your y equals. Type in the equation 3 sine theta, close parentheses, plus 1. You can look at the graph. Yeah, ugly. No good data from this graph. It's it doesn't. It's not working out. We're going to make a much better graph right here in just a second. So go to the table. Uh, press plus for delta table. Yeah, I think it's already set right, but we're going to do it again. Pi over twelve, just to check. Yeah, okay, it was already set right. I'm going to scroll all the way back up to zero. There's zero. And I'm going to copy these values from this table so that. Notice that some of the values agree, right? We already had 0, 1. We already had pi over 2, 4. So we're kind of like, it tells us we're, we're thinking in the right place. All right, so at angle 0, our radius is 1. At the next tick, it's about 1.7. Then we're at 2.5, 3.12, 3.5, 3 3.8, and 4. So it looks like we're kind of grad. I'm going to connect the dots right now. It looks like this part of the graph is going to gradually increase up to four. Okay. Now I wonder what's going to happen after that. Um, so after four, we go to 3.8. Right here. I'm going to do this in another color. We'll do a little rainbow graph here. We're going to 3.8, 3.5, 3.1. 3 nope. 3.8, 3 3.5, 3.1, 2.5, 1.7, 1, skip 1, no, 1 at pi, or 3.14159 is at 1. Now what happens? Okay, this is where we're going to get interesting. 3.14, we're at 1. Then I'm going to do next angle at 0.22. Right, okay, so the next quadrant we'll do in uh, red, orange, yellow, green. 22. Then the next angle, we're at negative. We're finally into the negative radii. So then it's going to smoothly go over here to negative 0.5. Then we're going to go negative 1.1, negative 1.5, negative 1.8, and negative 2. And I bet you anything that we're going to mirror that pattern back around. Yes, we are. Negative 1.8, negative 1.5, negative 1.1, negative 0.5. So remember, when we're doing the negative values, we're actually doing the angles in this quadrant, and they're just projecting negative uh, as we go around to make this nice inner loop. Negative 0.5, positive 0.22, finally, and back to 1. So let's sketch this curve out now, full thing. Loops back around. 
And then we join up with the inner loop right here. We have an inner loop. And we connect, and this turns out to be an inner loop limosome. Um, one thing I notice on my graph that's not actually there in the real graph is that this should be a smooth curve. There shouldn't be any pointy bits, so you can kind of, you know, take your take your pencil and smooth out the curve if you want. Yeah, take my rainbow pen and smooth out the curve into one continuous line. Doesn't really matter. That actually made it worse. Doesn't really matter. Um, but remember that it shouldn't it shouldn't look pointy in any location. And that, my friends is how to graph a polar equation by point plotting. Here are a couple cautions. Here's the things I see stu mistakes students make. Um, one mistake I see students make is that they don't play smart. That is, they haven't at least done enough of the reading uh, or watched enough of the videos to recognize what they're expecting. So like when I'm graphing this, I see these coefficients, I'm expecting some kind of limosome shape. And I've studied the limosomes and I know kind of roughly where they are, even if I'm not sure where exactly what this one will look like. I know what I'm looking for. I know I'm not looking for a flower. I know I'm not looking at a circle. I know exactly what I'm looking for. And the connection here helps me out. By the way, if I'm looking at this connection, right, the outer loop is shown by that kind of like top part of sign. And the inner loop is shown, the outer loop also is over there. The inner loop is shown by that lower part of sign. So if you ever have a graph that's kind of unbalanced above and below the axis, you know you're going to have an inner loop. When I had my flower graph, I knew I was looking for a, a flower graph. I even had a suspicion about the number of petals. So when I went to graph it and my calculator told me something, I wasn't just, you know, blindly following the calculator. Um, that is how we get into the matrix, is blindly following machines. And that's not what we want to be right now. Uh, we want to be smart individual humans that think and do problems by ourselves um, with just the aid of a calculator. And really, the calculator is a tool it will do exactly what you tell it. So if you're giving it garbage, what are you going to get? You're going to get garbage. Um, here's another thing people do that, that just the other big mistake, and I already kind of called it out, is if you don't really know what shape you're going for, and you're trying to do this by hand, or maybe you're doing it on the calculator, but you uh, mess up that negative radii. You say, uh, negative 0.5 at this point is in the wrong spot, or you just get off by one on here you end up with like a single point that's in the wrong spot. And then we get all kinds of creative, like, okay, there's an inner loop and it also loops around there. No, guys, I ain't never seen a polar graph that looks like that. If you see something weird on your polar graph, don't just connect the dots, check your work. It's probably a mistake. Polar graphs behave rationally. Uh, and so you want to kind of match those graphs as you see them. So the only thing we haven't really covered yet is the symmetry tests. There are some tests, and you saw them in your book, about how to test for polar axis symmetry. Um, I think I'm just going to leave those alone. I, between my calculator and what I know about polar graphs, I personally never, ever use those polar symmetry tests. Um, I might make another video later on as an optional video that, to, to go over them, but don't worry about the symmetry tests, I think. Uh, I would rather you just like kind of figure out the different kinds of polar graphs, practice your unit circle, get some good radians, use your polar graph paper. That's going to put you in a lot happier spot. The symmetry tests were, were really useful before we had any calculators, back when our book was kind of written. Um, but now, not so useful because we have all these other useful ways to check. So don't worry about the symmetry tests. Um, use them if you want. Don't use them if you don't want. And yeah, I don't know. That's about it. All right, folks, I'm going to sign out. Have a good night. Uh, hopefully, you know, email me with your questions, comments, concerns uh, about your polar graphs. If anything comes up, let me know. Do your homework, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you very much.